It is a monster hurricane, Sandy, now heading up to the eastern seaboard on a collision course with two other weather systems. Throughout the next hour, we will take you live to the northeast where people boarded up windows and filled sandbags in preparation for this superstorm. And of course, we have crews live along our coast to look at the impact of Sandy on North Carolina. Good evening and thanks for joining us for this special coverage of Hurricane Sandy. I'm David Crabtree. And I'm Deborah Morgan. We have a lot to bring you tonight. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Greg Fischel for the latest track on Hurricane Sandy. Look at the tremendous expanse of this cloud shield with this storm. This is a monster storm in size right now and will become a monster storm in terms of intensity as we head toward tomorrow and tomorrow night. Now we've been saying for days now that this storm is going to be epic in proportions and as bad as it is along our coast, it's going to be infinitely worse to the north. Well, Hurricane Sandy has been passing by our coast with ferocious winds and heavy rains. Bruce Mildworth has been in the thick of it at Kill Devil Hills, joins us now with an update this morning. Bruce, I know uh, last hour you said the power was out at Hatteras Village. Any change on that? No, no change there. I'm told by emergency management officials that the power in Hatteras Village will not be uh, back on until later this morning. And you talk about the thick of it. I am literally in the thick of it. This is the sea foam. This is an indication of how far the waves are coming up today, much farther than they had yesterday. And we're not even at high tide yet. So conditions out here on the beach worsening, not necessarily the wind. The wind is not as intense as it was yesterday, but the rain has picked up. The waves are more ferocious and stronger and rougher than they were yesterday coming up higher. Highway 12 a major issue because of the waves that are coming over and the sands that's being pushed on the road. Obviously, it is still closed south of Oregon Inlet uh, uh, down on Hatteras, but it's also impassable up in Kitty Hawk. In fact, we were riding along Kitty Hawk earlier this morning around 3.30 and driving on Highway 12 there, it was like an obstacle course and we have the video of it. Uh, there's debris everywhere, sand, concrete blocks, and the water just pushing through the dunes that were there to protect Highway 12. They're expecting maybe two to four feet of flooding on the ocean side and high tide is around 8 a.m. The main concern is as the winds shift, it is the south side, uh, the, the, the sound side flooding. And later on this morning, we'll see how bad that gets. But conditions here to likely deteriorate as the morning continues. Wow. Back to you. The ocean's angry right now, and uh, we're going to see a storm surge. Sandy is moving past North Carolina, headed for the northeast. It could get worse here, though, before it gets better. How big cities up north are bracing for the storm's arrival? This morning, the seas are just as high as they were when the hurricane. And I, I assume I've been looking at the WRL uh, satellite, uh, weather satellite, and I see that the storm looks like the hurricane passed us, but I guess this is the nor'easter that's looping around, and the sound's very angry, and the seas are just as high, so here we're seeing no relief. This looks much rougher than what we saw yesterday morning. Uh, tell us what you're dealing with out there, Bruce, and how it's it's changed in the last hour or so. Yeah, I mean, even the last half, the last half hour, I mean, the conditions have really gotten worse in just the last half hour, hour or so. The wind's picking up, the rain's still coming down, and the waves coming up farther than they have since we've been here. Don't forget, about 8, 8.15 is high tide. So for the next two hours or so, things could get really worse. And to find out what this really means, we're now being joined live by the Dare County Manager, Bobby Outen. And, and, and Bobby, thank you, first of all, for being here with us this morning in these conditions. Um, but first question, Highway 12, down south of Oregon Inlet. What is the very latest there? We know it's been impassable. Uh, where, where do we stand? It it's, remains impassable. It will remain impassable throughout this event. In fact, it's making landfall right now. Landfall, though, is just the eye of the storm. That means people have been dealing with the wind and rain for most of this day. Let's take a look now at conditions in lower Manhattan, where gusts have been uh, so high they snapped a part of this industrial crane. And here in North Carolina, a major story today came from a big ship and a stunning rescue caught on videotape. The HMS Bounty, a very popular ship, is lost 
14 crew members saved. We'll take you live to the Coast Guard station where the survivors were taken. And Governor Purdue summed up the state's experience with Sandy with one sentence. But in my mind, North Carolina on the coast has dodged a really strong bullet. And for that, we should all be eternally grateful. And the mountains are another story. The governor has issued a state of emergency declaration for another 24 counties in the west where flurries are already flying as Sandy wraps back around. We will take you live to the October snowfall event in just a few minutes. It's part of our team coverage over the next 90 minutes. We have live reports from the North Carolina coast, Delaware and lower Manhattan as Sandy arrives. A real life drama off the North Carolina coast today has captured international attention. The HMS Bounty tried to get to safer waters away from the storm. Instead, it sank about 90 miles off the coast of Cape Hatteras. 14 people were rescued. The survivors flown by helicopter to the Coast Guard station at Elizabeth City. And that's where WRAL's Amanda Lamb joins us now live. Amanda. David, as you said, members of the U.S. Coast Guard here at the headquarters in Elizabeth City have been very busy today. They had a daring rescue of 14 members, member, crew members from that ship early this morning, and they've been looking for two missing members from that ship throughout the day today. Now, they got the call early this morning that the ship was in trouble, that 16 people had gotten off of that ship into life rafts. The the Coast Guard helicopters hovered above those rafts as they kept turning over in the violent surf. A rescue swimmer took each survivor one by one, swam with them to a cage, and then they were lifted up in that cage into the helicopters. Now, the crew told us their teamwork and extensive training are what made this mission so successful. And again, that search for those two missing people continues. We are told that they have on survival suits. Those survival suits help keep them warm, also help keep them floating in the water, and that people can survive for as long as 15 hours. A look now at Hurricane Sandy by the numbers. Between the rain and the snow, this storm could impact people in more than 20 states, and more than 50 million people are in Sandy's direct path. Preliminary damage estimates are between 10 and 20 billion dollars. Joining us now is CBS correspondent Duarte Geraldino, who's been covering the storm from right here on the Delaware coast. Even if we didn't catch the brunt of the storm, there are plenty of issues on the Outer Banks. From flooding to closed roads and broken piers, WRL's Renee Chu joins us now live from Hill Devil Hills to show us some of the images. Renee? Deborah, as one resident told me today, you can't stop the ocean during a hurricane. Check out the waves behind me, the monster waves from this storm. Those waves rolled into the northern part of the Outer Banks, causing flooding all the way up to the 158 bypass. And residents say that kind of flooding is unusual. Irene did not cause oceanside flooding, but Sandy sure has. In Kitty Hawk, the water rose in many business parking lots, knee deep in some areas. Storm surge at high tide pushed the chilly ocean waters right into town. The last time people can remember it flooding this bad was from Isabel in 2003 and from a Halloween storm back in 1991. Check out Highway 12 in Kitty Hawk if you can even see it underneath all that sand. A section of it is closed as the heavy equipment tries to clear a path. And we found neighbors helping neighbors at the Kitty Hawk RV park that is now surrounded by water nearly waist high. Resident Jim Kernut tells me the water rose a foot and a half in about an hour and a half. A canoe makes it easier to get around as they tried to get their belongings to higher ground. This is my first time for a big flood here. Uh, I've only been here like two years, but um, it's, it's a mess. I was like, you know, a lot of people losing stuff and it's, it's sad because these people have been through it so many times already. Hurricane Sandy is doing something we have not seen in a very long time. One storm impacting both ends of the state. And we have just the crew to prove it. By this time yesterday, Brian Mims and Richard Atkins were showing us these conditions in Riceville Beach as Sandy headed north. Today, they traded rain for snow, drove to Boone to bring us the conditions there. Okay, Brian, I see you traded your rain gear for a hat as well. Ooh. You betcha. Trying to stay cozy in this. And what we're seeing now is just something beautiful, David. This is what I love about 
western North Carolina. We're not seeing any big puffy flakes just yet, just some good flurries here on King Street in downtown Boone. I've even heard word of whiteout conditions on nearby Grandfather Mountain. We're expecting to get anywhere from four to eight inches of accumulation in the Boone area overnight. Could even get more than that on the higher elevations, 5,000 feet and above. Right now, it's about 31 degrees. It's definitely cold. Let me show you around, show you some video. We accumulated this afternoon as the snow was coming down. It's what it looked like here for the last several hours, a constant flurry of flakes. First Oceanside flooding, and now all eyes are on the sound. What Sandy could have in store for the people on the Outer Banks. This is Boone, where we're wrapping up for a long, cold, snowy night. I'll show you this snowstorm just in time for Halloween. Today we saw Oceanside flooding, and tonight folks along the Sound are waiting to see what Sandy has in store for them. Night falls on the Outer Banks. Kitty Hawk police are standing guard. Ocean water still covering a quarter mile section of the 158 bypass after a sandy surge at high tide. And if winds change direction just so, water from the sound could be next to break free. We have that breaking news now. We just learned the Coast Guard found one of the two missing crew members after their ship sank off our coast today. They were on the HMS Bounty. At 4.30 this morning, the captain ordered everyone to abandon ship. The Coast Guard rescued 14 people. Now that makes it 15 people. The crew was on the move, hoping to avoid the hurricane when it started taking on water. WRL's Amanda Lamb spoke with the Coast Guard members involved in the rescue. Amanda? Deborah, they have been looking for those two missing crew members all day long. And about five minutes ago, we learned that 42-year-old Claudine Christian of Oklahoma had been found alone in the water, unresponsive, and was taken to Albemarle Hospital. Now, as you said, this all started early this morning. When they got there, there were 14 people in lifeboats. The ship was underwater except for the mass that was sticking out, an eerie sight, the crew members said. And the other person who is still missing is the longtime captain of this ship, 63-year-old Robin Walbridge. Like something out of the movie, The Perfect Storm, when the Coast Guard crew arrived at the life rafts carrying survivors from the HMS Bounty, the conditions looked insurmountable. Did you look down this morning and go, oh boy. It's going to be a tough one. About a dozen times. 30 foot swells and 50 mile an hour winds made for a dangerous mission. The rafts turned over in the violent surf multiple times. It was co-pilot Lieutenant Jenny Field's first rescue operation. All those things they tell you about in stories and things you have to watch for in school, but to actually go out there and see them for the first time and be able to put, you know, the book to action was was pretty, pretty amazing. It's like something out of a movie. Oh, absolutely. This is one of the cold water suits the survivors were wearing today. It kept them warm, it kept them floating, and it also allows rescuers to see them. And whenever I get bring, or brought to the door, I always think, okay, it's kind of game time, and I wind up going down. One by one, rescue swimmer Daniel Todd plucked nine people from a life raft, swam with them to the cage that was then lifted up into the helicopter. They did not panic at all. I told them what I needed from them in order for it to be safe and to run as smoothly and as quickly as possible. And it did. In just one hour, the nine were safely in the helicopter. It was pretty humbling, that's, that's for sure. A great feeling knowing that everybody's out and we're able to, to move on to the next step. Breaking news regarding the tall ship that sank off the coast of North Carolina. A woman found unresponsive in the water late today died at the hospital tonight. Her name is Claudine Christian. She was 42. These are pictures of her from Facebook and from her family. The Coast Guard was able to rescue 14 people who had been abandoned, who had abandoned the HMS Bounty. The captain, Robin Walbridge, is still missing. The famous tall ship sank about 90 miles off Hatteras early this morning. The Coast Guard helicopter hovered above the life rafts as they kept turning over in the violent surf. A rescue swimmer saved each survivor one by one. Well, if you've been outside tonight, you know how windy, mm -hmm. cold, and rainy it is right here. Renee just showed us what conditions are like along the coast. And to our west, people are seeing not only the wind, but snow. Brian Mims took the colossal trip from the coast to the mountains today. He joins us live from Boone, which may get some serious snow out of this storm. Brian? I'd say at least an inch has 
fallen so far and covering the ground. The wind has really had some umph to it, driving down the wind chill temperatures. I think it's in the teens now. People in these mountain communities are well seasoned when it comes to wintry weather. Winter often starts early, but even here, this is something of an October surprise. It's a clash of seasonal colors, a burst of fall mums against a blast of winter white. Crimson leaves cling tightly to the branches as if that cold wind is howling, let go, let go. Appalachian State student Graham Sullivan gets a handle on the cold by gripping hot chocolate. I wasn't ready for it either. I left all my winter stuff in Charlotte, so. You're still in a fall frame yeah, of mind. Yeah, I'm still in the fall <laughs> frame of mind, dear. As twilight sets in on King Street and Boone, <laughs> equipment shoves the slush from the sidewalks. Trucks scrape the streets. Locals hope this scene means things will look up for the ski slopes. Now what do you make of the projected accumulations? Four to eight inches. Yeah, that's what they're saying. I hope we get more. You hope we get more? Yeah, get the ski slopes opened up up here. From damage in the Northeast to snow in the Midwest, Sandy is definitely living up to its Superstorm title. Thank you for joining us. I'm Deborah Morgan. And I'm David Crabtree. Let's give you a look at some of the impressive images coming out of the storm affected areas, including some here in North Carolina. First, this is amateur video of the transformer explosion that took out power to part of New York City. Overall, Almost 8 million customers are without power across 15 states because of this storm. An electrical spark started this chain reaction fire that burned at least 80 homes in Queens. No lives lost there, but at least 39 people have died in this storm so far in the U.S. That includes two people here in North Carolina. The pictures out of New Jersey are astonishing. The town of Seaside Heights is gutted, and more towns are damaged by the floodwaters in that state. Governor Christie says nearly 2.5 million households were without power today, twice the number left powerless after Hurricane Irene last year. And how about the snow? West Virginia took a pounding in the storm. Not that the people at Snowshoe Ski Resort have complained. However, the cold and ice have stretched as far as Lake Michigan and all the way to North Carolina. This is a live picture from Boone where they had snowfall and snow fell on and off throughout the day. You can see a few flakes falling there. Brian Mims will join us live with a closer look at the North Carolina snowfall in the next half hour. 14 crew members were rescued safely, one died. Amanda Lamb joins us now from the Coast Guard Station in Elizabeth City with the latest on this continuing search and how these survivors are holding up. Amanda? David, those survivors are being helped by the Red Cross. We talked to members of the Red Cross today here in Elizabeth City, and they say those survivors are devastated by the loss of that crew member yesterday, and they're still holding out hope that their captain will be found alive. Helicopters searching for the captain of the HMS Bounty were back in the air Tuesday. Coast Guard officials believe the captain, 63-year-old Robin Walbridge, and 42-year-old Claudine Christian, who died Monday, may have fallen directly into the water as the ship rolled over. Hollywood makes everything big. Walbridge spoke to WRAL in 2005 about his pride in the bounty. They did everything. They discovered the new world with ships like this. This is just such an important part of our life. Roger, rescue checklist complete, ready for one. Basket recovery of survivor. The Coast Guard rescued 14 people from the raging seas by helicopter Monday morning. The Red Cross is assisting the survivors. Carolyn, how are the survivors doing? Well, at this time, as you can well imagine, they have been through a tragedy. Uh, they did lose one of their crew members, and they're just they're bonding together and being together to try to support each other. The majestic ship was on its way from Connecticut to Florida trying to get away from the storm. A Facebook post Saturday says their decision was, quote, calculated and that they would be safer at sea than in port. Coast Guard officials say there are several factors that may be working in the captain's favor. The belief that the gentleman was in uh, the appropriate survival equipment at the time and uh, the fact that the water temperature uh, was uh, uh, on or about uh, 70 degrees. Well, another problem on the Outer Banks today, the roads. The flooding, debris, accidents, all keeping people from getting where they need to go. Renee Chu, live in Kitty Hawk to show us just exactly what these people are up against. Renee? David, many cross streets leading to the beach road are closed because of this. 
ankle deep waters. This is ocean overwash from Sandy storm surge. Look at how it's just covering this entire stretch. It's covering the walkway of this home, the entire front yard, but fortunately it has not creeped into actual homes. So that's a good thing, but it's not just water on the roadways that people have to deal with. It's also sand, lots and lots of it on the beach road, also known as NC Highway 12 Virginia Dare Trail. Piles of sand clogging up the road for several miles, so it's off limits to car traffic. A quarter mile section of Highway 158, the bypass still closed in Kitty Hawk. Cars are being detoured throughout neighborhoods. It is very unusual to have flooding all the way up to the bypass. Back here to a live picture, we're just one row away from the beach access road. And if you go up a mile, I'm told that the storm surge had broken up chunks of asphalt of the beach road. So that will take weeks to repair. This could take days to clean up as crews have to pump out the water. Kevin Holmes is live at RDU International with a look at the impact for those trying to travel in and out of Raleigh. Kevin. David, there's a lot of red on the boards inside for both arrivals and departures. If you don't know what the red means, take a look at this video and we'll explain because there are 120 flights so far to and from RDU that have been canceled. Right now on WRAL, how much damage does Sandy leave in the state from flooded homes and streets in the Outer Banks? To all that snow in the mountains and we are not in the clear just yet. The HMS Bounty, the replica, has a rich and colorful history, as does the original ship that sailed more than 200 years ago. Scott Mason has the story of both. 2005, the Bounty engages in battle near Beaufort, though the cannon fire is not real. It's only a movie. The chest of Davy Jones. The Bounty appeared in two Pirates of the Caribbean movies. The ship made its film debut in 1962. I'm taking command of this ship. Mutiny on the Bounty starred Marlon Brando. I'm in command of this ship. Bounty arrived in Beaufort seven years ago for the Tall Ships Festival. There's uh, over 10 miles of uh, rigging on board the ship. There's 18 sails on the ship. It's a very complex piece of machinery. The ship is a replica of the HMS Bounty. During a long voyage in 1789, half the crew revolted, and there actually was Mutiny on the Bounty, which years later led to Mutiny on the Bounty, the movie, and Bounty, the replica built for the movie. And of course, it's a little bit bigger than the original one because it was built so that film crews and staff could be on board during the filming. Hollywood makes everything big. Looking at the way the name is carved into it to looking at the planking and the masts and all the rigging, you can't help but be stirred by this, this sort of nostalgic feeling of the high seas. They did everything. They discovered the new world with ships like this. This is just such an important part of our life. Bounty has long been a tourist attraction, capturing the romance of a rugged era upon the ocean. But until now, the danger has never been real. Yeah, here we go again. Bumper to bumper. Look at that dog <laughs> driving, David. Traffic stacked and back, trying to get to the Outer Banks this week. It's a struggle right now because of the Sandy-related issues along Highway 12. And as Renee Chu shows us, those headed there need to bring their patience. The beauty of the Outer Banks beckons. All you have to do is get down there. But Teresa Kiwak and Mark Bierman from Richmond find themselves in a traffic jam, waiting for the ferry at Stumpy Point. This is probably not how you wanted to start your Thanksgiving vacation. Not particularly. I was hoping for a nice straight trip down 12 to hit Avon and stay and have an enjoyable week, but we get the roundabout. <laughs> That's because these days your trip down Highway 12 south of the Oregon Inlet gets blocked by troopers and flashing lights. Patty and Jack Lewis are waiting it out in a parking lot. Because we can't get in, um, it's flooded, the overwash. Winds offshore, extra high tides, and a stretch of sandy crumpled pavement make Highway 12 problematic. Only four-wheel drive vehicles are allowed to make the trek. This week, overwash has shut down the road for six hours every day. So bring that reading material. I'm hoping to get there on the road. I just looked at some pictures of the overwash and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's probably questionable whether I'll get there or not. The situation summed up on souvenir shirts. Hatteras Island, one road on, one road off. Sometimes. That's why many choose the ferry route from Stumpy Point to Rodanthe. That opened up post-Sandy. Every two hours, it takes about 35 cars at a time. 
Of course, there is a priority list. Utility trucks, fuel trucks, and vendors get first dibs for the ferry. Then it's Hatteras Island residents get to go in this line. Everybody else has a long, long wait. North Carolinians are not strangers to picking up the pieces following a hurricane. So it's no wonder they were some of the first volunteers to head north after Hurricane Sandy slammed into the Northeast two weeks ago. This week, WRL will bring you their stories. The stories of North Carolinians rolling up their sleeves and helping strangers rebuild their lives after one of the most devastating natural disasters this country has ever seen. We begin in Island Park, New York, where Amanda Lamb caught up with Franklin Graham's relief group, Samaritan's Purse. Life literally stopped for people in Island Park, New York, two weeks ago when Hurricane Sandy came ashore. How much water was in your house? Uh, about three and a half feet. And when you came in and saw? It was, it was unbelievable, worse than I could ever imagine. I mean, you couldn't prepare for a storm like this. When you walk through the devastation of someone's home and you see things like drywall, insulation, personal items like movies and photographs, it's hard to imagine surviving something like this, but this homeowner tells WRAL he's got an army of angels on his side. One, two, three, three, two! The angels work for Samaritan's Purse. At first glance, it looks like a bomb was dropped on Breezy Point, New York. I mean, just looking out at this, it's just... It's crazy. Yeah, the destruction is terrible. You know, honestly, my thoughts and prayers are with everyone here. Marines from Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, have put those thoughts and prayers into action, helping homeowners get rid of water and debris left behind by Hurricane Sandy. In addition to the hurricane damage, people here in Breezy Point lost more than 100 homes due to a fire that started during the storm. People here say it will take years to rebuild. You can look and say, give me an example. This is Keith and Beth's house. Next to Keith and Beth was my friend Maureen and Frank Fow. In fact, Frank had that house since he was two years old. 73-year-old Marcella McGovern knows who owned every house that burned down around her. They took charge. They knew what, what to do. McGovern tells us the help from the military has been overwhelming. What does it feel like when you see all these people in uniform helping? I, I, I just, what America is to be like. I mean, it just thrilling. I didn't realize that it would be so in mass of human help. Pumped out the homes in the standing water that, that was preventing a lot of work from being done. Sergeant Edward Ramlau says it's hard to put into words what it means to be part of the relief effort. It feels good to uh, give a helping hand to those who need it and we're all motivated to be here and we're all proud of what we've done. You know, National Guard has been here. I mean, it'll take time, but you know, if, if anything, the people from New York, New Jersey, the tri-state area are strong. I mean, they're gonna rebound from this. You stay in a total shock. You have no, you just do not know which direction to go in. McGovern says she has no doubt about this. I'm coping with family, friends, and you know, faith, the church is always there. When you see pictures of what Hurricane Sandy did to Breezy Point, New York, it's hard to imagine such devastation happening to people you love. Over $5,000. But for Tara Navarro, a teacher at St. Mary Magdalene in Apex, the devastation hits close to home. And just to see that, it's the place where I grew up my whole life going to the beach. We have 20 different families that we're related to in Breezy Point. Navarro says all of her relatives in Breezy Point lost their homes or had their homes severely damaged. But it's tough being here with all my family You're in so Breezy far Point. Away. Right. Yeah. And this was actually the picture of uh, my wife's mother's house. Navarro's uncle, Gary Tully's home, was one of 2,800 affected. You can see the water came up to here, which is about eight feet high. Tully's home is still standing, but he's more worried about what this will mean for the future of his community. What's so hard to deal with is the uncertainty of what's going to happen. There's just been so many people that have come to me and said, how can we help? What can we do? And they are helping. Students at Navarro's school collected 310 blankets and more than $5,000 for the hurricane victims. The fundraiser is aimed at showing the kids that it's important to help people, whether they're in your community or here in the Northeast. We learned that it's important that everyone comes together as a community and helps people to get better because 
a lot of innocent people were hurt. Just knowing that you help somebody just makes you feel good. I'm just overwhelmed by everybody's compassion, overwhelmed by everybody's kindness and generosity. And so is Navarro's family. Incidents and catastrophes like these shrink our country dramatically, shrink the world dramatically. What makes you feel good is, is it connects young children at a young age to uh, uh, some of the realities of, of the world we live in.